thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net or rolw.org. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the missions outreach, the Bible college, and various coming events. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. The word that comes out of my mouth will be by the spirit and not by the flesh, and that it will be good seed planted on good soil, and that you would produce the, the harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to talk to you about grace and peace maximized and fully realized. Thank God for grace and peace, but we, want, we don't want just a little bit of grace and peace, right? We want the maximum amount of grace and peace that God has for us. And so that's what I want to share with you about this morning. It's not going to be a long sermon, but I just want to hit on a few key points that I believe the Lord's been laying upon my heart. And we'll begin in... Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. It says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. There's so much in this, these three verses. I want to begin here, but there's other verses I want to share with you also. But I, what caught my attention, first of all, in these verses is that second line, in your mind. <laughs> you know, our mind is usually our biggest problem, don't you think? I mean, whether, it's, whether you're talking about your, your mind is tempted to worry about things, your mind is tempted to be fearful of things, and... You know, if you listen to the news very much, the, the news gives you all kinds of things for your mind to be focused on. <laughs> and people suffer from anxiety and things like that. These are issues with the mind. And he says that you were alienated and enemies in your mind. And I think a lot of times that has to do with people are in their mind, they see themselves as enemies of God or they see they think God is against them in their mind. <laughs> And, you know, Joyce Meyer has said that the battle is in the mind, and it really is. The battle is in the mind. It has to do with, a lot of times, it's self-condemnation. That's, that's a mind issue. The things that we think on, that's why the Scripture talks a lot about meditating day and night on Scripture. Meditate day and night on the Word of God. Get your mind focused on the things of God. And that's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Have your mind focused on the kingdom of God and His righteousness and that'll take care of all the issues of your life. He'll, he'll take care of everything. If you get your mind straightened out, that's 90% of the battle, <laughs> maybe more than 90%. <laughs> get, get your mind thinking on the things of God and the things that God has placed on your heart and not what this world is throwing at you. So I wanted to begin with that, that if, if we want to go back, let, let me re remind you of the title. That's kind of small print. I don't know how well you can see it, but Grace and Peace maximized and fully realized, if you want that to be the reality in your life, the first thing we need to realize is the mind is what's the problem. <laughs> he says that you are sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, but it's a mind issue. We agree with that, right? <laughs> 99, at least 90% of your battle is your mind. Get your mind focused on the things of God. Then he says, yet now, Hath he reconciled? Reconciliation with God is not a future thing. It's a now thing. It's already done. Don't have the idea, and I'm sure everyone here is, that's pre present in this room is fully aware of this. You know, you're not trying to get yourself righteous with God. You're not trying to get yourself reconciled with God. It's already done. He says now. And then the word hath makes it past tense. So, it, it's, it's a reality now, but it was taken care of in the past, 2,000 years ago. So he hath reconciled you. It's already done. 
Stop trying to get yourself reconciled with God and realize it's already done. It's, it's a now present tense reality, but it's based upon something that took place 2,000 years ago. And it goes on to say, in the body of his flesh. So whatever was wrong with you or whatever, whatever you may see is currently wrong with you has already been dealt with 2,000 years ago in the body of his flesh. Whether it's a sin issue, it's taken care of in the body of his flesh through his death. Whether it's a sickness issue, it's been taken care of in the body of his flesh through his death. Whether it's a financial issue or a mental issue or a family issue, whatever it is, he has reconciled you. He has taken care of it in the body of his flesh through his death. So again, we need to fully realize this. This is why it, it's, it's all in the mind. It has to do with the mind. What if you believe you still have to get something right with God, then that's going to hinder you. If you believe you're still trying to work on in getting things right and getting things reconciled, that's going to be a problem. It's going to hold you back. But you need to realize, according to verses 21 and 22, he's already done it. You're already reconciled. Every issue of life has already been taken care of in the body of his flesh through his death. So what does he do? He presents you holy and unblavable and unreprovable. I like the wording of that. You are holy, right? How many of you are holy? Hallelujah. Every hand should be up. You are holy. But not only that, he says you are unblameable and unreprovable. I like those words. This is the King James Version. Unblameable. That means not only is there no blame coming against you from God, you are unblameable. In other words, Nobody in all creation can bring any accusation against you that will stick. <laughs> Unblameable. Unreprovable. So you are so righteous that nobody in all creation can ever bring anything against you. I, I'm not sure what you're saying. Undevourable. Well, I would have used that word if it was in here, but... <laughs> But it says unblameable, unreprovable, and Joy says undevourable, right? <laughs> and that too. And you might say, well, I see all kinds of problems in my life. I see this. You know, you can, pull, you can look at yourself in the mirror and, you, and start blaming yourself and reproving yourself for all kinds of things. But it says th those next three words, in his sight. You're unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you look at yourself and find accusations, well, that, again, goes back to those three words in your mind. <laughs> get your mind off of that and get your mind on what, what Christ has his mind on. In his sight, you're unblameable. In his sight, you're already holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. There's no blame. There's nothing that, that can come against you. There's no accusation that can come against you in his sight. You're holy. You're already holy. You're already unblameable and unreprovable. And in the, I think it's the New Living Translation that adds the words, without a single fault. So, <laughs> I like that also. You are without a single fault. And again, you might say, well, I can find all kinds of faults with me. You know, there's always people, a lot of people, probably most of us, that kind of rebuke ourselves from time to time or find accusations against ourselves. You know, I wish I could do this better. I wish I was better at that. We can find all kinds of fault within ourselves, in our own mind, but in his sight, we are without a single fault. But there's an if there. <laughs> if we continue in the faith, faith is a key issue. In other words, what you believe. If you believe you're unholy, then you're going to act unholy, most likely. If you believe you have problems A, B, and C, you're going to act like you have those problems. But if you continue in faith, in other words, you believe what God said about you, that's what faith really is. You know, you may have heard all kinds of great definitions for faith, but really what faith is, is just simply believing what God said about you. Believing it, speaking it, and acting like it. And... The next three words, grounded and settled. In other words, don't be wishy-washy about this. <laughs> be grounded in it. Be settled with it. As James said, don't be double-minded. 
Okay, don't don't waver back and forth. Be grounded and settled and be not moved away. I, I thought about suggesting to you, you know, that old hymn. What is it? We shall not be moved or I shall not be moved. You know that old hymn? You, I thought about suggesting that, but I thought about it too late. So I, But that's what he's saying here. And not be moved. Not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. So be grounded. Know what you believe. And the, you can only get there th through studying scripture, meditating on scripture, be grounded and settled in the faith that is based upon the word of God and be not moved away from it. Don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. How do you receive the gospel? By hearing, you know, that's another, we're going to look at that scripture a little bit later, but I, I noticed in a few of these places where it talks about, about faith and the power of the gospel, it mentions hearing it also, because that's how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We'll get to that scripture in a, in a few minutes. But I also wanted you to see what Peter said. Peter said, grace and peace. This is really the verse I, I got the title from, or the idea for the title. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So not only, I mean, it would be great if God would add grace and peace to us, but he's not talking about adding it. He's talking about multiplying it. <laughs> grace and peace be multiplied. And how do you get grace and peace to be multiplied to you? It says through knowledge, the knowledge of God. But I want you to know this isn't talking about head knowledge. There's a place for that, but this is talking about experiential knowledge. The Greek word is epignosis. It's a compound word in the Greek, meaning knowledge gained through first-hand relationship. Knowledge gained through first-hand relationship. Epignosis is referring to contact knowledge or experiential knowledge. So it's not knowing something through book knowledge. It's not all knowing all the facts and figures. It's, it's not that kind of knowledge. It's not head knowledge. But it's based upon knowledge that you gain through experience. So that's what he's talking about. You know, it's one thing to have a degree. It's, it's good to have a certificate or a degree to prove that you know something. But to actually experience something produces a completely different kind of knowledge, right? So he's talking about experiencing. You've experienced the love of God. You've experienced the grace of God. So that's the kind of knowledge that it's talking about. You can read and study all kinds of things about the love of God and the grace of God, but until you experience it, you don't really know it. Amen? So that's what it's talking about. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through experiential knowledge, relationship knowledge with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14, 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? What I want you to see here is, and again, I'm speaking, I'm speaking to the choir here because those of you that are here, you know this, that the only way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus. You know, those that, that kind of have the idea that there are many paths to God, there isn't. <laughs> There's one path to God, and that's Jesus. But when you know Jesus, you know God the Father. And this is what Jesus was saying. If you, because Philip had said, show us the Father, and then we'll, we'll, we'll believe you or something to that effect. And Jesus said, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That, that is such an intimacy, such a closeness. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. You can, you can pretend to know God. Or there's many religions that want you to think that they know God, but they don't know Jesus. But if you know Jesus, you know God. To double down on that, there's the, the scripture in Colossians 2, 9, for in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of God is in Jesus. The fullness of God is in Jesus. Now, this is interesting. I should have put verse 10 up there probably also because verse 10 goes on to say that the fullness of Jesus is in you. So the fullness of God is in Jesus, and then the next verse says the fullness of Jesus is in you, or something to that effect. The way to know God, the way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus. All this, all these scriptures that I'm pointing at today, 
have to do with developing an intimate relationship with God or an intimate relationship with Jesus as the path to intimacy with God the Father. And another scripture in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, who is the image? This is referring to Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So in other words, all these scriptures are telling us is that, that when you have a relationship with Jesus, as you develop intimacy with Jesus, you're going to have intimacy with God the Father. They go hand in hand. But you are to be fully captivated by Jesus. I've known Christians who feel like they have to spend a certain amount of time worshiping the Father, a certain amount of time worshiping Jesus, and a certain amount of time worshiping the Holy Spirit. I, I remember one person telling me a long time ago that she realized that she wasn't spending time with the Holy Spirit. She was spending time with the Father and with the Son, but she wasn't spending time with the Holy Spirit, and so she felt guilty about that. But the three are one. <laughs> and that scripture in Colossians 2, 9, have you ever had anyone tell you anything like that before? But Colossians 2, 9 says the fullness of the Godhead is in, is in Jesus. Uh, the, the idea of the new covenant, I believe, is that you're to be fully captivated by Jesus, fully focused on Jesus. Be intimate with Jesus. Let him be your all in all. And the fullness of the Godhead is in him, and he is the image of the invisible God. He has made himself known. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. He is the manifestation of God that we have a relationship with. Yes, not to diminish the importance of the Holy Spirit, not at all, but I believe we're to be captivated by Jesus, and even the Holy Spirit, his job is to point us to Jesus. So don't worry that the Holy Spirit's feelings are getting hurt. <laughs> and th there's another scripture in Hebrews 1 that kind of focuses on that, that who, who being in the brightness of his glory, again, it's talking about Jesus, in the brightness of his glory, in the express image of his person, Je Jesus is the express image of God and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. That word image is a word that means the exact duplicate or the exact, it's giving the idea that you can actually see him. He's, this is the image, this is the way that he manifested himself to the earth. It's like a, a duplicate or a carbon copy, a photocopy and an exact duplicate. You can actually see the invisible God by seeing Jesus. So look to Jesus. Let him consume your every thought, if possible. Have an awesome, ongoing awareness of his presence at all times, if you can. So Romans chapter 10, the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him, on him, whosoever believeth on him, shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the Lord, the same Lord, over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there's a few things I want to point out here. First of all, whosoever believeth. What I'm talking about this morning is available to whosoever. That means anybody. What's the one thing that's important here is belief. Whosoever believeth. That means have faith. If you believe you can, if you believe you can have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus, you can. If you believe any other promise that's in Scripture, it's a reality based upon what you believe. And it says there's no difference between Jew and Greek. In other words, it doesn't matter what your genealogy is. It doesn't matter what your heritage is. It doesn't matter what your race or culture or creed is. This is available to anyone, Jew, Greek. It doesn't matter. And it says the same Lord over all is rich. Did you know God is rich? <laughs> That's not a secret, right? Everybody knows God's rich. But what I want you to see, it says he is rich unto all that call upon him. Our Lord is rich. And the word that's translated rich means affluent in resources. He has an abundance of resource. But what I want you really to see is why is God rich? Yes, the Lord is rich. Everybody knows God's rich, but why is he rich? He's not rich because he needs the wealth. I mean, if he needs anything, he can just speak it into existence. So why is he rich? It says rich unto all. In other words, he's rich for your benefit. The reason he's rich is to bless you. The reason he's rich is because he wants 
you to have an abundance of blessings. This is God's grace. He's not rich for his own benefit. He's rich for your benefit. He's rich unto all them that call upon him. So whatever your need is, call upon him. He's rich enough to take care of that need. <laughs> Whether we're talking about spiritual, physical, financial, mental, it doesn't matter what the need is. He's rich to take care of that need. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you know the Greek word for saved, which I talk about frequently, is sozo. It's a complete salvation of your spirit, soul, and body. Whatever it is that you need, he's there to take care of it. And the next couple of verses goes on to say, How then shall they call upon him that hath not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? Notice again, it connects the word believe with the, with the hearing. You can't believe something unless you hear it, unless it's preached to you. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So the gospel that we preach is a gospel of peace. It's not a gospel of condemnation. It's not a gospel of judgment. It's not a gospel of law and rules and performance-based religion. It's a gospel of peace. The true gospel is a go gospel of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's a supernatural peace that passes all understanding. So the, the peace of God isn't what's being preached in most churches. Glad tidings of good things is not what they're declaring. Most churches are preaching do's and don'ts, law and judgment, performance, but we preach Jesus, we preach grace and peace, we preach favor and rest, and we preach the freedom of the Holy Spirit. And the next couple of verses, but they have not obeyed the gospel. For Elias saith, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Some translations say hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It would be easy, it would be easy for a person to look at verse 16 and, see, and say something like, see, you've got to obey. You've got, Christianity is all about obedience. You have to obey. But what is the obedience that he's talking about? He's talking about the obedience of faith. In the context, he's talking about obeying the gospel and Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So he's talking about faith. In other words, belief. Belief is the obedience that he's talking about. You can see throughout, I talked about this, I think, a week or two ago, that, that the commandments of God are faith and love. We can see scriptures that talk about, uh, I think it's in 1 John where it says, this is his commandment that you believe, that you have faith, and that you love the brethren. So, so faith is the obedience that he's talking about. The way, you know, any other obedience, he, he obeyed on your behalf. He fulfilled even that. He obeyed on your behalf. So the obedience we do is obedience of faith or obedience of the gospel. It's, called, it's, it's talking about obeying the gospel here, but it's the obedience of faith. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I heard one person say, when I was, I was trying to get her to attend a, a healing service, and she said, well, I, heard, I already know that. I already heard all that. But faith doesn't come from having heard the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word, of, the word of God. So it's not just hearing it and knowing it. You might say, well, yeah, I know that. I know what the Bible says. But you need to continue to hear it. And as you hear it and hear it and hear it, your faith is built up. So what shall we say to these things? Verse Relationship, absolutely. So um, going to chapter 8, what shall we say to these things? And we're going to close with these verses, I believe, in, in Romans 8. What shall we say to, to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Now, the, these things that he's talking about in verse 31, he's reflecting back at the earlier things that he said in this chapter about no condemnation. And the chapter, Romans chapter 8, I, if you haven't studied it for a while, I strongly recommend it. I think a lot of people believe that this is the most powerful chapter in the Bible, and I, I tend to think that also. 
Romans chapter 8 talks about no condemnation. It talks about being led by the Spirit. It talks about being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. It talks about all things working together for the good to those that love God. It talks about predestination, the, the, the fact that God foreknew you and he predestined a plan for you. There's a lot of powerful truths in this chapter. And Paul says in verse 31, what, what can we say about all these things? In other words, there's so many. It's almost like he's saying, what else can I say? It's like, it's like he's speechless. You know, I've said all this, all these promises, all these benefits, all these great things that you have in Christ. What else is there to say? If God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't that an awesome truth? You don't need to be afraid of anything or anybody because if God's for you, nothing, nobody and nothing can be against you. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. You know that Jesus wasn't, or let's say, it, let me put it this way. He wasn't murdered by the Jews. He wasn't murdered by the Romans. He said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down. So the father, it says, it's talking about the father delivering up the son. Can you imagine delivering up your son, your own son to save somebody else? And he did this for you. I would say he must be radically in love with us. <laughs> He delivered up his own son, his only begotten son, his son that was spotless. Jesus didn't have any sin. He had no sin. He did no sin. There, there was nothing negative about him in any way, but, he w but the father delivered him on our behalf. So if he's willing to do that, he goes on to ask, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Jesus went to the cross so that you can have access to everything that is in Jesus. The righteousness, the health, the prosperity, the mental ability, whatever it is, whatever it is that you need, it's, it was in Jesus, and it is in Jesus, but he went to the cross so that you would have access to that. So if he delivers Jesus up to the cross, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? In other words, I, I'm emphasizing the word freely because it costs you nothing. That's why it's grace. You don't have to work to, for it. You don't have to, what are some of the religious things that, you, that people make you do? All the, the Our Fathers and Hail Marys and, and even in charismatic circles, you know, they might say, well, you need to say your confessions, you know, spend 15 minutes saying your confessions every morning. And I'm not against saying confessions. I'm, I consider myself word of faith and I believe in positive confession, but even that can become a work. And even that can become bondage. And it can become religiosity. Anything that becomes a work, you've stepped out of grace. If it becomes like a law that you have to do, like I used to force myself to get up early in the morning. I've told you guys this before. I forced myself to get up extra early, and I felt, that I, I felt like it was something I needed to do to make myself more spiritual spend an hour or two in the morning in prayer, which I still do that, but I have more time to do it now than what I used to. <laughs> but, but when I try to do it, I, I don't get up at three in the morning anymore or even four. But when I did that, more times than not, five minutes later, I'd be asleep again. Have any of you done that before? Get up extra early because you're so spiritual, you're going to get up early and spend time with the Lord and you just fall right asleep. So I'm glad I'm not the only one that has done that. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? So obviously this is saying that God gave up his most prized possession for you. And though Jesus had no sin, he knew no sin, he did no sin, yet judgment and punishment against all of our sins fell upon Jesus. And these verses are just proving to us how much God loves us. Just look to him, just lean on him, and he is there to, to help you in any situation, whether it be tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, whatever it is that's coming against you, that's not going to separate you from the love of Christ. And he is there to help you in every situation. He said he would never leave you nor forsake you. 
Well, this continues along the same lines. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So the idea that I'm trying to convey to you is get your mind so convinced that God is radically in love with you. Be fully and thoroughly convinced that he'll move heaven and earth to get to you, to get the, the answer to you, to, to get the solution. And it mentions, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, even if you die, you're in the presence of God. So even if you die, you win. <laughs> nor life, nor angels, spiritual beings, principalities, which most people consider that as referring to demonic spirits, powers, that might be referring to government power. So even if the government comes against you. And it seems like they're trying to do that, right? <laughs> even the government coming against you. You know, even if, by the way, there is an election in Virginia this year. You guys know that, right? I hope everybody's registered to vote. I voted last Thursday. Early, early voting has started. But even if that doesn't go our way, we still win. You know, even if all the elections are stolen, not, not saying I believe one way or the other, but <laughs> I think you guys know where I stand on that. But anyway, even, even if the next election is stolen, we still win. Even that's not going to hinder God's love for us. So, so neither principalities nor, 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 nor angels nor demonic powers nor government powers nor things present. So no matter what it is you're going through in your life today, whether it's a health issue or financial issues or family issues, whatever it is, Things present, God's, God's got it, nor things to come. You don't know your future, but he does. You can't see what's going to happen tomorrow or next year or over the next few years. But he knows the future, so just leave it in his hands. Let him take care of it. Nor heights, nor death, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I actually want to close in this with this scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 18. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I want to point out verse 17, because I said earlier, I was trying to point out the fact that the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus. And even this verse 17, it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the Lord. It says the Lord is that spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So again, it gets back to it's, it's all, we're to be focused, fully captivated by Jesus. It's all in Jesus. The fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus. But I also want to point out that this talks about the veil. The veil represents laws and commands. The veil here represents do's and don'ts, religiosity and performance, a performance mindset. So instead of focusing on all of that, instead of focusing on all the do's and the don'ts and the performance mindset, instead of focusing on that, stay focused on Jesus. See Jesus in everything that you do. See Jesus in all, in all aspects of life. Let him consume your every thought. If there's any issue of your life that you're battling, just take it to Jesus and leave it with Jesus. Our tendency is to take it to Jesus and then pick it right back up, right? I, we, we, we give it to Jesus. Yeah, we want to help. We give it to Jesus and then we say, Lord, let me help you with that. <laughs> but we need to take it to him and just leave it with him. Jesus loves you beyond words. He's radically in love with you. Be fully consumed and captivated with him and with his word. And I'm going to read these scriptures in a translation called The Voice. Have you guys heard of The Voice? I don't think I've ever read this translation before, but it's, it's interesting. I passed on to you the tradition the Lord gave to me. On the same night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread in his hands and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is 
my body broken for you. Keep doing this so that you and all who come after you have a vivid reminder of me. So in, in this translation, he's saying, do it, but keep doing it. <laughs> and it causes us to have a vivid reminder of him. So if you would, let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus, and we thank you, Jesus, that you took our place, you lived that righteous life that we couldn't live, and you, you, you went to the cross on our behalf, you took our sins, our sickness, our poverty, our mental issues, our family issues, our fear issues, our anxiety, you took it all upon yourself, and we thank you, Lord, for taking our place, and we, we do give thanks, we know that as you are, so are we in this world, and so we receive the righteousness that you give us so freely. We receive health and healing. We receive abundance of prosperity, sound mind, wisdom, and freedom from fear, peace of mind, joy, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, all that you have for us, we just receive it by faith right now as we partake. Go ahead and partake. After they had finished dinner, he took the cup in the same way and said, This cup is the new covenant executed in my blood. Keep doing this. And whenever you drink it, you and all who come after you will have a vivid reminder of me. Every time you taste this bread and every time you place the cup, of your, the cup to your mouth and drink, you are declaring the Lord's death, which is the ultimate expression of his faithfulness and love until he comes again. If you would repeat after me, <clears throat> thank you, Jesus, for taking my place. Thank you for the gift of righteousness. I ask you to be Lord of every part of my life. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And we do this in remembrance of you. Go ahead and drink. Your name is beautiful. Hallelujah. This is Pastor Ken Miller at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church, 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150, in the countryside area of Sterling, Virginia. I'd like to encourage you to join us Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Again, it's Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church, 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150 in Sterling, Virginia. Our Sunday morning service is at 11 o'clock. Join us in person or watch us live streaming on Facebook. God bless you. We were lost without you. We were dead without you. But you came into our heart. And you changed our name. We were lost without you. We were dead without you. But you came into our hearts and gave us a new name. We were lost without you. We were dead without you. But you came into our hearts and gave us a new name. We're talking about unveiling Jesus today, and we're going to begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. This is the New American Standard Bible. But we all, with unveiled faith, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So we all, with an unveiled face. Now, the King James says, uh, we all with an open face, but most translations say an unveiled face. So... We're, we're beholding as in a mirror. So as we study scriptures, as we grow in Christ, we're beginning to see ourselves in the image of Jesus. Do you guys see the image of Jesus in you? Maybe at least more now than you did a few years ago. You, you see yourselves being transformed into his image uh, as, as the years go by, as the days go by. Uh, you're beginning to see the very image of Jesus in yourself, and, and, and we should. Being transformed from glory to glory. So it's, it's not an overnight thing. It is an overnight thing in your spirit. You're instantly in the image of Jesus when you're born again. 
in your spirit. And you might say, well, I still have some of the same old bad habits. I still struggle with this problem or that problem. But there is a transformation taking place that begins, began in your spirit and it overflows into your soul and even into your body. Praise God. And to the point where, <laughs> where he says that your youth is renewed. There are several scriptures I want to look at, but the bottom line is I want you to see Jesus. So let's look at <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. It says, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you to, into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Did you know you have... You're, you are without a single fault as far as God's concerned. So when you look in that mirror, don't see all your faults. See Jesus. <laughs> but, but you must continue to believe this. Con he says continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance that you've received when, when you heard the good news. The first thing I want you to see here, I know this print's kind of small, but... Feel free to use your Bibles that are on your laps. I'm sure you guys have Bibles. <laughs> I know we get out of the habit of bringing Bibles because it's always projected up here. But notice that it says he has reconciled. This is already, already done. It's already accomplished. It's past tense. It's not that he's going to reconcile you to himself. It's already done. It's past tense. So stop trying to accomplish what he says is already done. And we have a tendency to do that trying to perfect ourselves, trying to make ourselves more of a Christian. <laughs> but he's already reconciled you to him, to himself. And so you're already in his presence. You're already holy. You're already blameless. Did you know that? You're already standing before him without a single fault. So stop, stop being sin conscious. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of times we're just too focused on sin, and we need to stop being so sin conscious and be more Jesus conscious. You must believe it's, he goes on to say in verse 23 that you must believe this. You must continue to believe this truth. You must believe it. Stand firm in this truth and don't drift away from it. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, it says that the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. What does that mean? Do you know this word strength is the Greek word dunamis? Do you guys know the Greek word dunamis? What, what verse do you know dunamis from primarily? Acts 1.8, right? You will receive power. And that word power is dunamis. You will receive power, dunamis power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the word dunamis is the word we get dynamite from. It's dynamic power. It's explosive power. Well, here he uses the word dunamis in referring to sin. The dunamis, the, the explosive power of sin is the law. So by trying to obey the law, you're just strengthening sin. You're not getting rid of sin. You're just strengthening sin. The more law-minded you get, the more sin will have dominance in your life, it seems to me. But, you know, if you focus on sin, if you focus on the law, you're strengthening sin's grip in your life. So if, if the power of sin is the law, I would say that the power of holiness is grace. If the power of sin is the law, I suggest that the strength of holiness is grace. And let's look at Titus chapter 2. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing, instructing us to deny ungodliness. The grace of God has appeared. What does it mean, the grace of God has appeared? The grace of God has appeared because grace is a person, and his name is Jesus. Grace has appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. Grace. And it, go, it says grace is instructing us. We don't need the law to instruct us. Grace is instructing us. Amen? So grace is instructing us. Stra grace instructs us to deny ungodliness. Grace is our teacher. We don't need the law to be our teacher. According to this verse, grace is our teacher. So allow grace to teach you this morning. Don't let the law be your teacher. Let grace be your teacher. Find your rest in his amazing grace. The law won't do anything to help you live a holy life. It'll just tell you how you're not doing it correctly. <laughs> the law won't tell you how to improve your behavior. It'll just tell you 
how you're not doing it correctly. So I believe that, I really believe that the more you know and grasp a hold of the grace of God, the more you will reflect holiness and godliness in your life. It's not, it's not that you're trying to live more holy. It just happens effortlessly. It happens automatically because the grace of God is exploding on the inside of you, praise God. So if you live according to your own self-efforts in this life, it's going to be, and you've heard this before, it's going to be do good, get good, feel good about yourself on the good days. Or it'll be do bad, get bad, and feel bad about yourself on the other days. So it's not about law. It's all about grace, and it's all about Jesus, really. So however you live, if you live under grace, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I'd like for us to look at another scripture that you're, you're familiar with, Galatians 2.20. But I want to read Galatians 2.19 through 21 in the Message Bible. And I'm not really, frankly, I'm usually not very much of a fan of the Message Bible because it's not a true translation. It's more of a paraphrase. But, but this just brings out, really, I think the heart of what Paul was trying to say here. He, he says that what actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. Christ life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I've been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before, before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not going back to that. Is it not clear to you that to go back to that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God? I refuse to do that, to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. Amen. Do you, do you, do you see that? Let, let me say this. It's all about Jesus. <laughs> and all scripture, every bit of scripture from cover to cover, it's all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, we could say from the index all the way back to the maps. It's all about Jesus. All right. You know, the Old Testament is all about Jesus. Every single spot where you read scripture, if you don't see Jesus, you're missing it. You're missing the point of the story if you don't see Jesus. The story of Joseph, I think, is one of the most clear examples, a perfect portrayal of Jesus. It's, it, Jesus Joseph was betrayed by the brethren, his brethren. He was sold into slavery. Jesus, of course, was betrayed by his brethren, the people he came to minister to. They, they As their Messiah, they rejected him. But ultimately, Joseph triumphs, and he ascends to the right hand of the king, the right hand of the throne. And of course, Jesus ultimately triumphs and, and ascends, and it's said that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Joseph demonstrates an abundance of grace and forgiveness to, to the brothers that betrayed him, just as Jesus displays an abundance of grace and forgiveness to us. So most people read the story of Joseph and they think that it's about Joseph. Or they read the story of Joseph and perhaps they think it's about them. You know, if I try hard, if I live holy, if I'm close to God, no matter how much I suffer in this life, no matter how many people come against me or, or betray me, I can get it through. I can get through this if I, if I forgive, <laughs> if I try hard enough, if I trust God enough, I can get through this and God will help me overcome. They think the story is about how they're supposed to live. It's not about that. If you read stories like this and you believe that it's instructing you how to behave, You'll either, be, you'll either come out of it smug and self-righteous because you feel like you're doing it correctly, or you're going to come out of it feeling condemned and crushed and it, with despair because you know that you cannot measure up to even the standard of Joseph. I cannot, you know, people have hurt me. People have done wrong. I can't forgive them. You know, a lot of people have the attitude, I just can't forgive them. So you're either going to, if you see the story of Joseph or any of these stories about you, you think it's about you and what you have to do, like I said, you're either going to come out of it smug and self-righteous or you're going to be completely crushed <laughs> with despair. 
saying I can just never do that. But if you don't see Jesus in every story of the Old Testament, you're not reading it right. Until you see yourself as a recipient of everything that Jesus has done, as the one that Joseph was representing or typifying, we call it types and shadows, he was a type of Jesus, and the story of Isaac. You, when you look at the story of Isaac, there, you know, there's really not a lot of mention of Isaac in the Old Testament, but, but the two or three places where he is mentioned, he's clearly a type of Christ. So if you read Isaac, which means laughter, and you, you need to see that, that the true son of laughter of grace is Jesus. When you read about Joshua, you, you need to see the true general of the hosts of the army of the Lord is Jesus. When you read about Jonah, you need to see that the true prophet who died for his people is Jesus. It doesn't really talk about Jonah dying, but it go, he says he was in the belly of the whale, the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, which, of course, is a type of, and shadow of Jesus being in the belly of the earth, the, script, the scripture says, for three days and three nights. So all these stories tell us something about Jesus. They all point us to Jesus. Moses, Moses, the deliverer of his people. Jesus is the true deliverer of all mankind. And everything in Exodus points us to Jesus. If you look at, we've talked about some of these in the past, the, 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 they came to bitter water and he, put, he was told to put the tree in the water which symbolizes the cross and the water becomes sweet. Everything in the tabernacle is, is symbolically telling us something about Jesus or his redemptive work. Every furniture, and because Hebrews explains a lot of this, how everything points to Jesus. Everything in the tabernacle, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. All the offerings, all the ceremonies, all the, all the rituals that they did, it all points to Jesus. And, and you need to see that. Even the rock, remember that rock, Moses was told to strike the rock just like Jesus was struck and crucified for you and, and water poured out of that rock. And the scripture says that Jesus gives us the rivers of living water. It's easy to say, well, the, yeah, that rock symbolizes Jesus. But, you know, Paul doesn't say the rock symbolizes Jesus. What does Paul say? He says that rock was Christ. <laughs> I don't understand that. But, you know, that rock followed them throughout the world. Everywhere they went, that rock was there. And, and Paul says that rock was Christ. So he was all over the Old Testament. I'll go one step further. I would say even the golden rule is not about you. And the golden rule is not for you. Now, don't, don't hear me wrong. You know, it, it's, you know, some people say, well, I, the golden rule is all about Jesus. All right. Some people will say, many people say, well, if you just live by the golden rule, that's all you need. Or if you just live by love, you know, the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, that's all you need, just love. But I will suggest to you that the golden rule is impossible for you to keep. Loving your neighbor as yourself is impossible to do. It, you know, if you meet the needs of other people, even strangers, with all the power and passion, creativity, and love that you would show yourself, who does that? Only Jesus did that. You give the same love that you give to yourself. You care for your needs and you care for other people's needs equally to the same amount that, that you do for yourself. I would suggest that you take a look at the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, the, the religious people came by. This, it says there was this half-dead guy. I won't go into a lot of detail for the sake of time, but there was this half-dead guy who, who, who was beaten up and robbed. The religious people came by and they intentionally, it says a priest and then it says a Levite, they intentionally, intentionally they, it says they see this half-dead guy, but they go to the other side of the street and walk and pretend to not see him. They completely ignore him. The religious people just ignore this half-dead guy, but then it says this Samaritan who was despised by the, by the religious Jews, he comes by and he takes care of him literally as if he was taking care of himself. He, he gives him his, his donkey to ride on nurses his wounds he takes them and puts them up in a motel he pays for the motel for several days he gives money to the innkeeper saying you know t please take care of him and if it, when i return if you need more money if there's if 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 you spent more than this i'll reimburse you whatever else you spend i used to look at that and i was thinking nobody does that why is it his responsibility to take care of this stranger nobody on earth would think it was his responsibility 
Most of us, if we see somebody in need, we might point them in the right direction, but we won't take that burden upon ourselves to take care of every detail of their need and then tell the, the innkeeper, whatever else money you need, just let me know and I'll give it to you. This is truly loving your neighbor as yourself. The, the Good Samaritan story, because the religious people that were talking to Jesus at the time, they were talking about you know, loving our neighbor as ourself and we love our neighbor as ourself. And then they ask, well, who is our neighbor? And Jesus goes into this, this story. Loving your neighbor as yourself means that whatever you would do to take care of your own needs, you will do it to help somebody else also. And we might do that for a relative, a, a child or a parent or a spouse or a sibling, but we wouldn't do that for a stranger. At least I don't think most of us would. But Jesus is the only one that fulfilled the golden rule perfectly. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. Your name is beautiful. This is Pastor Ken Miller at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church, 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150, in the countryside area of Sterling, Virginia. I'd like to encourage you to join us Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Again, it's Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church, 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150, in Sterling, Virginia. Join us in person or watch us live streaming on Facebook. God bless you. We were lost without you. We were dead without you, but you came into our hearts and you changed our name. We were lost without you, we were dead without you, but you came into our hearts and gave us a new name. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. From just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church in Northern Virginia, thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. You can get information about this ministry at AbidingLife.net. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at AbidingLife.net. I've got to have, got to have, got to have.